What an extraordinary film. I'd like to ask you to please welcome Nicholas back with our special guests, the filmmaker Alexandra Doles and Dr. Sabah. Can everybody hear us? Yes, perfect. I'm just going to arrange my papers just one second. So before we open it up for a Q&A, I just wanted to make sure to introduce uh, Alexandra as well as Dr. Samah and just give a quick biography. And the way that the Q&A will work is after I introduce them, um, we will have a mic that will be roaming around. So just raise your hand, I'll call on you, and the mic will find you. The one thing that we ask, please, is to keep your questions concise and short to the point. If you do have comments, by all means, do comment. But same thing, just keep them as, as concise as possible. Um, we're going to go for about 30 to 45 minutes, depending on how many questions you have. All right. So I'll first start by introducing doc, uh, Dr. Samar Jabir. Um, she is a Palestinian psychiatrist, psychotherapist, and writer. She graduated from Al-Quds University in Jerusalem, Pierre and Marie Curie University and Diderot University in Paris, and the Israeli Institute of Psychoanalytic Psychotherapy. She addresses the individual and collective psychological damage of the Israeli occupation. She was born in East Jerusalem um, and worked in various cities in the West Bank. She was the head of the Ramallah Community Mental Health Center and is now chair of the mental health unit at the Ministry of Health. As a clinician, she holds a private practice as well and also works as a medical trainer and advisor for local and international NGOs. Can we please welcome once again, Dr. Samah Shabir. And on my left, the director of the movie that you just saw, Alexandra Doles. Uh, she hails from France. She came all the way from Paris. Um, she's an author, director, and producer. She co-founded Hybrid Pulse, and within it, co-produced and directed several shorts and two feature documentaries. Her first feature documentary, by the title of Mujahidat, was actually screened and came out in 2008. And this is her second feature, the one that you just saw beyond the front lines, that came out in 2017. She is a contributor to the French website, Le Cinéma et Politique, which means movies are politics or movies are political. Uh, she's also been teaching visual literacy in a self-defense perspective in working class neighborhoods since 2009. Issues of power and image are a core component of her transdisciplinary work. In 2017, she co-published Dr. Samar Shabit's first book with French publishing house, PMN Edition. Please welcome with me uh, Alexandra Dolls. All right. So I'll start with one question and then we'll open it up to the audience. Again, please raise your hand so that we can call on you. Um, I guess the first question I think that a lot of people probably want to know about, and I address this to both you, Alexandra, as well as you, Doctor. Um, how did you two meet and decide to work on this documentary? It was touched upon a little bit in the movie where you said you had read some of Dr. Samah's work. Could you elaborate a little bit more on that? Okay. Um, do you hear me? Yeah? It's okay. Um, first, um, I would like to, to thank a lot uh, the organizer of the, this beautiful festival, Houston Palestine Film Festival. It's an honor for me to be there with you, and uh, that Beyond the Frontline is opening the festival. Thanks for this generous introduction, and for the museum to, to host it, uh, us. Um, sorry in advance with my broken English. I try uh, to, to do my best. Um, how did we meet together, right? Um, First, I have um, discovered, I have met uh, Sama through her text, through her chronicles, which uh, has been translated in French. So, um, and um, a way to, to write um, let me a deep impact because at this time I, I get um, principle, I get against colonialism principle, but when I have read her, I, I, I have begun to visualize 
the situation and how she shared about her daily life as a woman, as a Jerusalemite, who cross every day the checkpoint as a clinician. Um, all this level makes me um, a deep impact. And also because I thought that uh, this question of how psychology is completely relinked with politics is central. And um, I thought that uh, I, I, I must uh, meet her and uh, this her job is very precious. Thank you. Dr. Samah, would you like to add to that? Well, I, I join Alexandra in thanking the organizers of this festival and thanking you for the very generous uh, introduction. My pleasure. And uh, yeah, actually, Alexandra wrote to me asking to meet and to, uh, to discuss the possibility of making this film. She wrote to me at a difficult time when I stopped writing for a while. And it took me a while before I responded to her email saying, yes, we will, I'm ready to discuss it. And uh, she I inspired me with trust. I could trust her on uh, doing this kind of work. Trust her and the team that she worked with. Uh, and I knew right from the beginning that this is not uh, big media. And uh, there, there was, uh, uh, I understood that this is a humble, uh, uh, they had humble uh, possibilities for this film. Uh, but there was something very authentic and credible about uh, the kind of work that they wanted to do. So uh, I, I, I made the necessary time <laughs> for this film. It required a lot of time. I can imagine. Well, thank you for that. Thank you very much for both of you. Um, I think at this point we can open it up to the audience. Again, if you have any questions, please raise your hand and I will call up. Okay, I see a hand all the way in the back. Yes, the gentleman all the way in the back row. Could you please stand up? Thank you. Good evening. Um, um, thank you so much for a wonderful, wonderful uh, moving project. And uh, congratulations, Dr. Jaber and uh, Alexandra on this uh, amazing film. Um, my question, to be precise, is with regards to the meaning of resilience and what it meant to each and every story that we've heard from from the baker, from Rula, from all the, the witnesses. What concerns me when it comes to um, the Palestinian definition of resilience is that it often is more of an abstract idea, that it's, it, it's often more of a wishful thinking than actual determination, self-determination, or plan to politic politically change their situations. And we see it by basically nothing that has changed for the, t for the better for the, for the past 70 years. So, but so in, in the field of psychiatry or psychology, what does resilience mean to you or to those who spoke about resilience? Okay, thank you for that question. I'm going to address that question to Dr. Jaber. Well, I, I, it seems uh, very pessimistic to say that uh, over 70 years nothing has changed. I think the plan for Palestinians was to eradicate them, to uh, impose uh, uh, complete surrender on them. Uh, the plan for Palestinians is to make them like uh, other uh, native population in different colonial uh, imperialist uh, countries. And uh, uh, we saw in the film the, uh, how the identity of Palestinian is fragmented um, in different geographical contexts, but also uh, the playing Israel and the policies of the occupation play on the Christian Palestinian, uh, Christian Muslim uh, 
diversity, uh, the, the queer uh, population is um, uh, perceived uh, uh, negatively uh, by uh, a larger Palestinian community. And I think the people who spoke in the, in the film, they try to deliver a common message. This is what I, he I hear from uh, in this film. Uh, they are aware of the uh, uh, strategies of fragmenting the Palestinian community and uh, creating uh, friction, and uh, they try to maintain the Palestinian identity, uh, nevertheless. Now, the concept of resilience comes from Western uh, and modern Western uh, mental health literature. The concept of sumud uh, is much older. Uh, we can read in, in uh, Palestinian literature that was written uh, during the British mandate, for example, uh, some texts that are using the word sumud as a, an individual and a collective reaction to political oppression. And I think Palestinians have not, Palestinian scholars and researchers have not yet studied the, uh, how different Palestinians conceptualize the term sumud. And uh, yes, I, I agree that sometimes the term was misused. Uh, for example, there was the, uh, the front of sumud and tasaddi, which was uh, established in reaction to the, uh, in 77, after the, uh, the Camp David Agreement, after Sadat uh, has uh, made the peace uh, treaty with, with Israel. So there was uh, a, a coalition in the Arab world that was called the, the uh, Front of Sumud and Confrontation. Uh, and unfortunately, it did not last. So it failed to do the, the, the Sumud. It was, uh, it, it collapsed in three years uh, when Israel attacked Iraq, the nuclear weapon in, in Iraq. Uh, and there are s other examples of where the w word sumud was, was used, but it didn't, um, it didn't give Palestinians what they expect of uh, resources that can maintain their solidarity and steadfastness. Uh, but I think the Palestinian experience can give unusual examples of uh, uh, of steadfastness and resilience and uh, uh, coping with the, 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 the difficult political situation. Uh, uh, at least we saw the baker, Khadr Adnan, who gives an example of that. And uh, that example is not rare in Palestine. There are very unusual uh, individual examples. Now, a lot of work needs to be done to identify the collective aspects of, uh, of the Sumud and, the, uh, and different ways to uh, nourish it, to, uh, uh, to make it stronger. Thank you, Dr. Javid. Um, any other questions? Yes, I see. Uh, um, first, congratulations, uh, Dr. Sabar, for your uh, remarkable eloquence, uh, your I incredible um, determination, and uh, almost uh, infinite hope. Uh, that's really inspiring. Um, so my question is, uh, as Americans, um, what do you think an American who is sympathetic for the Palestinian cause how they can contribute to the BDS movement. It's a very live thing. It's going on for a while now. And we already see some effects that uh, minds are slowly changing, even in the political sphere here. If you have any comments on how uh, maybe especially the youth um, can engage themselves here. Thank you for that question. Dr. Jabir, do you have any insight into that? Uh, I think that it is more appropriate to uh, return this question back to Americans, what they can do. And I would, ask, I would ask another question. I think for every person who wants to be in solidarity with the Palestinians, he needs to, uh, 
to understand his motivations, why he wants to be in solidarity with Palestinians, his limitations, his capacities, and how to do the necessary networking with Palestinians to establish uh, equal partnership so that they can work together uh, to realize certain objectives. Uh, and maybe, uh, maybe people can use some uh, uh, understanding from social psychology to make their work more organized and more uh, uh, effective. Uh, and people can be trained to do the solidarity in, in a good way and effective way. But I think the, the work starts by asking the right question, why I want to be in solidarity with the Palestinians. And I think people have different objectives and different motivations by doing so. Now, uh, the, uh, the a simpler answer would be look around, see what, what um, available venues are there and who is doing this work in, a, in an effective way. Uh, we have a colleague here from uh, USA Palestine Mental Health Network. This is uh, a solidarity group uh, that is based in the United States, but also in the UK, and we are establishing a French and Belgium networks also. Uh, we're trying to create uh, solidarity in the field of mental health, among mental health professionals. And I think uh, this is another good example of uh, solidarity where uh, it represents good uh, collaboration between Palestinians and internationals. Thank you, Dr. Jabbar. Uh, yes. Dr. Samah, did you ever find out from the mother who uh, said that she danced uh, like a slaughtered chicken after she found out that her son was killed and you were interrupted at 11 a.m. Did you ever find out why she used that expression? Uh, actually, I met with her later on and she uh, mentioned a, a poem a, in which the description of uh, an undeclared pain uh, was like uh, the dance of a slaughtered chicken. I think it comes from, from that poem. Thank you. Um, I've got one question here from a uh, couple of people. Oh, yes, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, thank you for this, uh, this very inspiring movie, and uh, and I was curious. Uh, there was an example given of uh, someone who had a very negative impact from his prison time and starting to get uh, hallucinations and so on. Um, I'm curious. Uh, I didn't hear anything about drug abuse, and I didn't hear anything of if there's been any contrast between Gaza and the West Bank or, or even 48. And I'm curious if there have been any psychological studies of the, the increasing um, oppression of Gaza and how that's impacted. And I'm, and I'm sort of curious also if the trend, if the, you're noticing a trend of, of breakdowns as opposed to resilience and um, so anyway, I was just curious from a psychological standpoint if you, if you see that. So I will answer uh, part of that question, um, the, the one that is related to the, uh, uh, the information about drug <coughs> abuse and uh, the questions that are related to, to psychiatry. But maybe uh, I, I will mention one thing. This film is not about psychiatry. It's, it's not about mental health per se. Uh, it's not about my work as a psychiatrist. I'm speaking as an ordinary Palestinian here. And maybe Alexandra can uh, explain her choice to, uh, to, take the, to take me to that direction in, in the film and uh, show less clinical work and clinical data about uh, our patients. Uh, drug uh, abuse is a growing problem in Palestine. So there was a recent study last year, 2018, 
that showed that 1.8 percent of the male population above 15, uh, they have uh, uh, a harmful, harmful use of, of drugs. Um, now, the international prevalence is 5 percent of ever used. 5 percent of people ever used drug. And that's 5 uh, percent of males and females. So we are concerned in uh, about the, the growing number. It, it compares to a study that was made in 2006 that showed less prevalence. Uh, and um, uh, it is, uh, uh, I know from my clinical experience that uh, cheap drugs are provided uh, sometimes as free samples to Palestinian laborers uh, where uh, some synthetic uh, marijuana, for, ex uh, for example, uh, is provided and it has names like Mastolon, Mabsuton, Mr. Nice Guy. Uh, and it gives, um, it suggests to the laborers that these products give you a capacity to work harder. And it was provided at the beginning as free samples and then uh, uh, at a very cheap price, like 20 shekels for a packet. It's like less than four or five dollars. And unfortunately, many young people used that and very quickly, very quickly, they develop psychotic symptoms, and we see them in the clinic. Uh, a lot of work is being, done, uh, is being done to raise awareness uh, regarding this issue, and recently we opened a, uh, the Palestinian National uh, Center for Rehabilitation in uh, Beit Lahim for all over the West Bank, and we are training people in the 14 centers uh, uh, maybe what's not mentioned in the film, uh, mental health staff are very few in Palestine. We have 22 psychiatrists for a population of 3 million in the West Bank. We have 10 psychiatrists for a population of 2 million in Gaza. We have 36 uh, clinical psychologists all over Palestine, and the demand is very high. So we can imagine the gap. And we have many ways to deal with the mental health gap. For example, we train uh, people who are not mental health professionals, like uh, school teachers, counselors, general doctors, and nurses to provide low intensity interventions. Uh, the mental health unit uh, that uh, I'm responsible for is supposed to be taking care of mental health services in the West Bank and in, in Gaza as well. But unfortunately, because of the conflict, because of the uh, partition between Gaza, the political uh, internal conflict between two important party parties in Palestine, uh, the mental health unit is not doing its job in, in Gaza. I have uh, good information about uh, mental health activities there. But this is not part of my official mandate in these years. We hope for better times in which we will be taking responsibility for mental health activities in Gaza. Yes, the situation is, is different a little bit. For example, the, the kind of drugs that are uh, common in Gaza, uh, the, the most uh, prevalent used drugs are uh, uh, doctor prescribed drugs, or let's say painkiller. Um, for example, uh, opiates, opiates and uh, pergabaline, um, uh, which is also used as a painkiller sometimes. Uh, and we can imagine many people were um, maimed and they got, uh, some of the people who were interviewed for, for that study, for example, they said that they started using that, uh, them after amputation and for, for pain. In, in, in the West Bank, synthetic marijuana and recreational drugs are uh, more common. But there are many other differences. This is just an example of that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Samar. Uh, perhaps before we jump to that next question, I promise we will get there. I just want to make sure to kind of follow up on what, what uh, Dr. Javid just mentioned in her response with regards to, um, you know, how this was portrayed from a, from a cinematic perspective. So this question is really for Alexandra. Can you provide us a little bit more insight 
and a little bit more background as to why somebody from France would decide to do a movie about Palestine. And this hopefully ties with the gentleman's solidarity question. So um, it took me a long time um, to decide to, to go to Palestine. Um, I see beyond the front lines in the um, direct um, continuity, continuum after my first uh, feature documentary, Mujahidat, about uh, women commitments in Algeria for the liberation. At this time, um, I produced it, it and I uh, realized it in 2007. And um, I have discovered the, the work of uh, Franz Fanon, which uh, maybe some people here know him, uh, which was a um, psychiatrist uh, anti gay and also against colonialism, of French colonialism. And um, at the same time, I discover the work of Sama and the mind um, of Franz Fanon. They share the, the question of there is no decolonization, decolonization um, without uh, decolonization of mind. So it was my first uh, door um, to to think about uh, um, a new movie uh, in Palestine. Um, and um, really, Sama, when uh, I decided to just to meet her uh, for beginning, but as a yes, as a door for um, for writing. You know, I, n I see my movie as a road movie, a road movie inside Palestine, Palestine as a character also, inside the landscape, inside the street, inside, I hope, um, managing to capture a piece of soul of the um, country. So um, it's a sort of road movie inside Palestine uh, and inside our mind. And um, yes. Thank you very much, Alexandra. Thank you. Yes, I promised we'd go back to you. Thank you. Uh, um, this is a question, I think, for Alexandra. Uh, as you know, there's a lot of um, depiction of BDS activists as being anti Semitic. And, um, and I'm, I know in France, especially, there's some of this. Um, pushback against uh, BDS and, and calling it that. So I'm kind of wondering if you, ha what the reaction has been in France and around the world, and if you've experienced any, even though this isn't explicitly about um, BDS, but it kind of has a subtle call to it, uh, if you've, ex what, what the reception has been and uh, in other venues, especially um, in Europe, perhaps. Thank you for that question. Alexandra? You know, as a um, filmmaker and also as a um, normal citizen or with paper or without paper, uh, I think this period is um, a big opportunity to, it's a big struggle to not being um, intimidate. It's a question of intimidation. And it's a question as artists or pe other people as activists or I don't know, to, to not um, be silen silencing by uh, uh, intimidation. And it's the question of, of not self-censorship also. Because there is uh, explicit censorship. But I think the most dangerous is the self-censorship. When, uh, for example, when I, I, uh, when we do the editing, doing more than uh, 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 17 weeks, a long time, uh, I, je pesais, je pesais, I. We're weighing. At what? Weighing. Uh, weighing. Um, weighing. Every, every words, 
every seconds, every scene. And um, I imagine what will be the reaction. And if it's legal, if it's not legal, um, what could be the future in France? And um, uh, there is something unfair in France, and maybe also in Amer America. Um, there is uh, not there is not a big room in mainstream media for take uh, grateful to artists who try to to take. Uh, the reality in Palestine for sharing it with audience. Um, in France, you can uh, you can criticize uh, all all kind of country. Encore um, plus, even more if it's a Muslim country, for example. But um, it's very challenging to to release this sort of movie uh, in the national release, in the mainstream media, and we did it. So it's, um, it's, a, <laughs> it's a big thing. I'm so grateful. Um, I'm so grateful with all the Palestinian character who trust our team, um, especially Sama, of course, because she, she came uh, accompany with me. She came with me for many screening for um, and also uh, with my team because uh, at the beginning the movie didn't receive uh, any official uh, funding from the French state. So if the movie exists is uh, um, thanks to professionals who, who give their time, their skills, um, to help this movie happen, and also thanks to a crowdfunding and solidarity group, and my own uh, fund also. Thank you very much, Alexandra. Yes, next question. Uh, <coughs> thank you very much for all that you've done in this movie and uh, all the information. I do have a technical question, an artistic question uh, to Alexandra. When, uh, towards the end of the movie, when, uh, with the title that uh, we all dance, but we dance to different beats, I wonder why you chose not to use the Palestinian Depke, the very famous, you know, landmark of, of dance for Palestinians. Why, di why you didn't, you chose not to use it in contrast to the other dances that you showed? Or I if that was intentional and, and the reason behind it? I love the Palestinian dabke. I would love to uh, learn it. Um, I thought about it, but uh, really, there is um, there is uh, th things um, as uh, mektub, and um, uh, I have okay. I have already uh, a big interest in parkour because uh, parkour. Um, I, I believe that uh, parkour um, was born in suburb, in French suburb, and there is a, a meaning who who pleased me a lot because um, this young guy and woman um, um, go beyond the wall, play with the wall. And um, also in France, and, uh, and I imagine in Palestine, um, for escaping the cops. So uh, they al Quds parkour. Uh, they they do a great uh, job. They they were amazing. Uh, soon they they will have a documentary uh, about them. And um, I was very interested in their action. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandra. I've got another question here on the left. Oh, on the right. Okay, let's start with the left, and then we'll go to the right. Okay. So my question is for Alexandra. I just wanted to ask you about public opinion in France about the Palestinians 
and the awareness that the French people have about Palestinians and, and specifically if they have any awareness that Palestinian Christians exist or if they just, you know, have like the general perception that Americans have or, or people in other countries, you know, that all Palestinians are Muslims, even though Jesus was born in Bethlehem. <laughs> so, you know, you don't, you don't connect the dots. Even, even, you know, this is supposed to be a Christian nation. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Of course, that has to be, you know, a place with a lot of Christians. Sure. Uh, <laughs> there, are, there are a lot of French people who didn't know that they are Christian Palestinian. Um, it was important for me to to meet uh, Atala Hanna because um, also not the main reason, but also because in France there is a big propaganda around um, how Christian people, when they live with Muslim people, uh, they um, they are in den they are in dangerous because of Muslim people. And um, what uh, I find interesting in uh, the testimony of Atala Hanna, first, he deconfessionalizes deconfession the conflict. He desectarianizes the conflict. Um, he, he he didn't talk about uh, the, the situation in uh, religious world. He talked about uh, human rights, justice, and he, uh, and he, um, he repeat that a Christian Palestinian or Muslim Palestinian or a atheist, atheist Palestinian, at a checkpoint, they, they are equal. Uh, they are still in face of a checkpoint of a soldier. And this kind of reality, it's very important because uh, to what I claim is that it's a colonial situation and we should uh, develop tools to talk about it as a colonial issue. Thank you very much, Alexandra. There was a question on the right. I think I saw somebody raise their hand there. Mm -hmm. And then we'll go to the gentleman here in the front after. Thank you very much, Alexandra and Dr. Uh, Jaber, for this film, which I think it was really very, very powerful. It has really many messages behind it. So uh, kudos to you for putting that. It, it, it's really remarkable, remarkable. I think we should get copies and send them to every member of Congress here to see the <laughs> so-called Israel shares our values and so on, what it does to the Palestinians. So my uh, question is, has there been any thought of whether through your connections or maybe Israeli peace groups like B'Tselem or others to show this film in Israel to Israelis, uh, Alexander or Dr. Jaber, or do you think this will make even any difference? I'm going to address this question to both of you, uh, maybe starting with Dr. Sama and then after to Alexandra. The film was shown uh, to a small and very specific Israeli group who asked to screen the film. It's a group called Psychoactive, a group of uh, mental health professionals, Israeli mental health professionals who are interested to learn more and to sometimes support the Palestinian plight. Uh, and it was difficult was shown twice to do two different groups, once in Jerusalem, in West Jerusalem, and another time in Tel Aviv. And uh, there was a lot of silence, uh, a lot of, uh, th the reactions were very interesting. Uh, some people wrote emails uh, a few days after they needed time to digest, saying that it provoked difficult emo emotions uh, uh, for them. Uh, and it was shown to Palestinians as well in different places in Bethlehem and in Nablus. Uh, maybe, maybe, mm? in East and in East Jerusalem as well. Uh, and some said that uh, they are tired of watching Palestinian movies. Uh, they know that reality, but this film inspires hope. 
uh, to the Palestinians. Uh, and they make them understand the mechanisms that, uh, uh, in which power does a lot of psychological damage to, to individuals. And once they can understand these mechanisms, they can face it in, in a more effective way. Thank you, Dr. Jabr. Alexandra, would you like to add to that? Um, I think uh, I would like that the movie could be spread more um, towards the uh, Israeli audience, towards the Palestinian audience and in an in international way, uh, considering also the BDS recommendation uh, for the spreading. But uh, I'm sure that uh, there, there is an Israeli audience who, who could, um, who would like to discover it, yeah. Okay, thank you, Alexandra. Um, I'm gonna go to the gentleman here in the front and then I promise we'll go back to you. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. We'll both, we'll get to both of you, go ahead. Thank you so much, we truly appreciate you being here and helping us understand better. My question for Dr. Jobber, if you would so honor me, <laughs> would be to First of all, say thank you for clarifying that this is not a film about psychology or psychiatry. I thought that was very important. So I'm perhaps understanding better that this is more of an analogy that it can be seen in a, the framework of medicine or psychiatry, but it's not about that per se. However, I wonder if you have identified in your observations certain groups, just as in medicine, that are more at risk, if they're individuals or groups within society that may be more at risk of this type of psychological damage. And whether you perhaps see samud or resilience as being a type of prevention or an immunization against uh, further damage that, that may be done perhaps for a younger generation that, that has not, uh, uh, that may still be able to um, not become as afflicted um, Thank you so much. So when we talk about the psychological damage, uh, what, what is expected is that we usually use the Western terminology to explain that damage. People want us to give diagnosis and prevalence of diagnosis. And uh, in, in my work, I try to challenge that and describe that, uh, yes, of course, we see we have data that shows a higher prevalence of some common mental disorders like uh, anxiety, depression, uh, trauma reactions, which is not exactly PTSD like it is described in the Western society. Uh, but there is also uh, another kind of damage that cannot be classified in or categorized in the usual way. There is a lot of the feeling of uh, the internalization of inferiority uh, the feelings of alienation uh, that are sometimes they are pervasive in, in, in the society. There are special groups at risk, ex-prisoners and their families, people who are affected directly uh, by uh, political violence, like uh, whose homes get demolished uh, as part of collective punishment for the act of uh, a member of, of the family. Uh, the Israeli policies uh, mean to do uh, a lot of psychological damage for individuals and to punish the family and to punish the society and to break the solidarity. I will give one example. Examples are endless, but I will give one example. Um, I recently, there were several attacks by adolescent Palestinians against soldiers, which already shows a problem in the structure of society when the Palestinian leadership is so important at protecting the Palestinian interests, adolescents fill the gap. They uh, take the lead. They want to liberate Palestine. They want to go after the occupation. So you, you see a very young, like sometimes 12 or 13 year old child who's not armed, who's not trained. He will take a knife and he will go after a soldier, a, who is armed to his teeth, and uh, at distance zero, they try to uh, to uh, stab them. Uh, so, 
this, a person like that gets killed immediately. But not only that, Israel freezes the, uh, the cadaver, the, the corpse, body. the body of that individual for many months. And they get into negotiations with the family. And they accept to return the body after many months of negotiation, but only when the family accepts that uh, the body will, uh, will be buried in the middle of the night and only 12 members of the family will participate sometimes in a different town. Uh, there was a time in which uh, when a Palestinian dies due to political violence, he's, he's glorified as a martyr by the nation and the whole town will go, will participate in his funeral. So there is a very systematic uh, way to destroy the Palestinian solidarity. Uh, now, I don't think that uh, sumud or resilience is, uh, is an immunization. And I don't think it's a static thing. It's, uh, it's a dynamic quality that includes uh, some characteristics of the individual, but some collective uh, opportunities as well, and it can wax and wane. It can uh, be stronger at certain times and get weaker at certain times. And if we study that in a scholarly way and identify the uh, psychological properties, the psychometric properties of the Palestinian sumud or resilience, uh, I think we can contribute to strengthening the Palestinian uh, sumud. But we, you know, we talk uh, often about the difficult situation in Palestine. Nevertheless, our data shows that uh, suicide, for example, is, although, although we see sometimes it, it gets worse and we have higher numbers, but it is not a big issue in Palestine. Uh, in spite of all poverty in, in Palestine, for example, in Jerusalem, 75% uh, of the population are under poverty line. Uh, but you don't see people eating from searching for food in, in, in the trash. Uh, in, in spite of all home demolition, people don't sleep in the streets. So there are certain observations that make us say that in general, the population is, uh, there are elements of, of solidarity. And I think, and the family structure is very important. And I think Israel is deliberately targeting the family structure. Uh, so uh, the people who are affected directly, prisoners, 20% of the population uh, pass time in prison. Uh, they another source of, of uh, sumud, of resilience, uh, that we need to take care of is education for Palestinians. Uh, families are very keen on educating their children. Uh, some people, some uneducated parents, from the villages who gather money with a lot of difficulties when they sell the olive oil after harvesting the, the olives in, in the season. They send their son to, to university, but when the son graduates with big hopes, uh, they are shocked with the unemployment rate. Uh, so uh, young people, youth, they don't find enough opportunity to participate effectively in the community. That's a group that we need to take care of. Those are just examples. I, I cannot give an exhaustive response to, to your important question. But uh, yeah, we, we are aware of certain groups at risk. Unemployment, for example, for we have 60% of uh, people in universities who graduate with high degrees. They are women. But unemployment rate for women is much higher than it is for men. And in general, it is very high for, uh, for the population. Thank you, Dr. Jabir. We have time for one last question. Gentleman in the front, Thank you. please. For the film. Dr. Salah, um, I wanted to ask, my question just has two parts, really. Um, about, you said that, or oh, I heard that you study also in, an is in the Israeli Psychoanalytic Psychotherapy Institute. So my question was, firstly, I mean, if you could say what that experience was like and if there was any sort of dialogue um, around 
the situation with your teachers and colleagues, and sort of not unrelated to that, is about psychoanalytic tools. I, whether you think that they are, um, I mean, I think you've been addressing it in some way, but whether they are, nu are they neutral? Um, um, if that question makes sense. I, I, if they, I, you know, because there's, because psychoanalysis developed in particular contexts and um, it's continuing to evolve. Okay. Thank you. Well, uh, when I studied at the Israeli Institute, it was, um, I wanted to, uh, okay, let me explain that right from the beginning. My uh, status as a Jerusalemite is a status of a person with no citizenship. And uh, in order to uh, maintain my residency, my threatened residency to Jerusalem, there are many difficult rules and regulations, including that I cannot be away from the country for more than three years. So I had part of my education in France, and I couldn't, con uh, it, it was enough for me to, uh, to go back, uh, pass the licensing exams to become, the board exams to become a psychiatrist. I did other years previously in psychiatry in different places, but I cannot leave three uh, continuous years um, uh, abroad. So when I came back, I wanted to, um, I was uh, uh, surprised at the big load of work and I thought that I need to study more and be exposed to other kind of uh, psychotherapeutic schools. The available thing that, the thing that was available for me is the Israeli Institute of Psychoanalytic Psychotherapy. I did also some cognitive behavioral therapy in, in the UK. Um, so I wanted to, to, uh, to learn more because uh, I often take the things that I learned and teach other Palestinians. And uh, if I had another, another opportunity, I would have learned in, in a different place. The experience was a difficult one, and I survived it. It was a difficult one. I will give you uh, two examples of how it was difficult. It's not a place of dialogue, and I have a lot of reservation about dialogue also, because in the current political climate, when we meet with Israelis in uh, well-groomed conditions to talk, this is not dialogue. It's often a, a monologue of Israelis in the presence of some Palestinian uh, uh, persons, but it's not a real dialogue. But anyway, in, in I'll give two examples of, of my experience at the Institute. Uh, between lectures, people ate together. And I always brought uh, a, a Palestinian item. Often it was hummus with some uh, uh, peppers and, and something like that. And people were very suspicious of the hummus that I brought. <laughs> <laughs> so that was one thing. Another, another thing, at, uh, I was studying uh, when Israelis attacked Gaza in 2012, and I had a colleague. Uh, so at, at that time, Israelis were debating whether they would do a, a, an invasion, uh, uh, like, uh, how, do you, how do you call that? Uh, uh, land inv ground. ground invasion to Gaza. And it, it was scary. We were, we, every Palestinian was scared about that possibility. And at that time, one of my colleagues, who is a, res a reserve soldier, uh, received a phone call during the classes, during the, the, the time of studying, and he announced, announced it to everybody that he, uh, he received a, a call from the army, and he will go because of that invasion. And the whole class was very empathic and expressing uh, solidarity to him. And there was complete oblivion and blindness to my presence. I was the only Arab the only Palestinian uh, uh, student in, in that school. So it was a tough experience, to, to say the least. Thank you very much, Dr. Zabarin. Thank you all very much for 
all of your questions. Um, this is the end of uh, our session. If you're interested in learning more about this, um, you'll also see on the website dates for future projections and uh, showings of the movie over the next week here in the U.S. And we'd like to thank uh, Dr. Liz Berger um, at USA Palestine Mental Health Network for sponsoring the next week and the trips of Dr. Javed and Alexandra. Thank you again very much. We hope Thank to see you, you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much.